Únete a nosotros en un viaje a través del tiempo y el espacio, de las reinas de lo viejo a los colores de lo nuevo. La verdad se ha perdido a través del tiempo y la mentira para representar a los antiguos como salvaje tienen que conspirar. Pero pieza por pieza, la verdad está siendo descubierta y revelada. Descubramos los hechos de esta gran tierra. Desde los aztecas de Tenochtitlan hasta el valle sacrado de Tepoztlán. ¡Viva México! ¡Let's go! Mexico City is one of the largest cities in the world, which brings about a lot of diversity. The city is made up of several different boroughs. One part of the city can be completely different than the next. The city is rich in colors, culture, and sights to see. What's special about Mexico City to me is its history. As one of the world's oldest continuously populated areas, just a few centuries ago, this land was completely different. Five centuries ago, this location was the prosperous capital city of Tenochtitlan at the heart of the Aztec civilization. In the early 14th century, the Aztecs settled at Lake Texcoco after seeing the fulfillment of a prophecy where an eagle sat on top of a cactus with a snake in its mouth. The great city they built, Tenochtitlan, was larger than London, Paris, and Rome. When the Spanish first arrived here, they were in amazement at the extravagant system of canals which connected the network of man-made islands and farms. Tenochtitlan was unlike anything the Spanish ever saw in Europe. There in the center of the lake was this gleaming white city. It was something they had never seen before. And for us, we could almost imagine as Dorothy looking at, the, uh, you know, at Oz for the first time. It was far larger at uh, a quarter of a million people than any city they had ever seen in Europe. However, instead of seeking to learn and trade with the Aztecs like civilized people do, the savage Spaniards went to war with the natives and with the great assistance of disease wiped the local civilization out. I purposefully use the word savage Spaniards because typically the story is put in reverse. Typically the native populations all over the earth are depicted as savages along with being intellectually and militarily inferior to their colonizers. However, upon a deeper analysis we find that in many instances throughout the earth this is not true. Disease brought about by the Europeans decimated the native civilization in the Americas which opened the door for the conquistadors to conquer with relative ease. The ruins behind me are the only remnants of the once great temple of Mayor. History is written by the victors, and they always portray themselves as the heroes. Mostly all of what we read in history books is just the narrative given to us by the Spanish. What historians take as original source material in their letters written by the conquistadors is severely biased information truth mixed with falsehood. The common narrative describing the Aztecs is that they were bloodthirsty killers whose entire life was based upon their routine ritual of human sacrifice. This depiction was given by the Spanish from the beginning. Hernan Cortes himself, who led the expedition to destroy Tenochtitlan, writes about the Aztecs in one of his letters to Spain, stating that they have a most horrid and abominable custom which truly ought to be punished. Many of the reports from the conquistadors were either false or greatly exaggerated. However, the original narrative they created has been perpetuated today. Michael Harner, in his 1977 article, The Enigma of Aztec Sacrifices, estimated that a number of persons sacrificed in central Mexico during the 15th century was as high as 250,000 per year. However, to date, those numbers are a far off from the actual amount of bones and skulls that have been recorded at any site, and through analysis, many scholars now deem those numbers previously mentioned to be impossible. Bernal Diaz del Castillo was one of Cortez's men. He is considered one of the classical sources of information about mass sacrifice by the Aztecs. Diaz claimed to have witnessed such rituals in his book, The True History of the Conquest of New Spain. 
which he actually wrote several years after the events. However, in a World Press Review article in 1992, Peter Hasler published an article titled The Lies of the Conquistadors, quoting Diaz on his proposed witnessing of the sacrifice of several of his comrades. Hasler argues that for Diaz to have witnessed such an event was impossible, as the Spaniards had just retreated from one of their clashes with the Aztecs to their campgrounds at least three to four miles away. At this distance, it would have been impossible to see or hear anything. Conquistador Pedro de Cieza de Leon openly admitted to the mixing of truth and falsehoods that the conquistadors were guilty of. In regards to documentation, there are not many pre-colonial era Aztec codices and documents left. Many of the visuals in the codices available were created for Spanish patrons and thus may reflect Spanish beliefs and perceptions. It is also known that some of the people who were killed by the Aztecs were captured enemy warriors. A public execution of an enemy is far different than the daily killing of your own citizens. I am not saying that the Aztecs did not practice human sacrifice to any degree, however I am saying that the typical narrative given to the Aztecs is purposeful propaganda with the intent to lessen the humanity of the natives, in an attempt by the Spaniards to make their massacre of them less criminal an attempt to justify their genocide. Upon conquering Tenochtitlan, the Europeans destroyed the city and systematically took apart their temples and used the stones to build the new Spanish cathedrals. The worst part about colonization is that the colonizers often destroy the way of life of the native inhabitants and then try to make the natives into themselves. They take your land and teach your children so that they never learn of the glory of their ancestors. The colonizers give you their way of life, their ideology, and their religion. Today, La Ciudad de Mexico sits on the dried lake bed of Lake Texcoco in the Valley of Mexico, surrounded by mountains on each side. During Cortez's siege of Tenochtitlan, he destroyed the dam which kept the city from flooding. Since Mexico City was built on top of Tenochtitlan after the dams were destroyed, the city has repeatedly suffered from severe flooding damage. Because of this, it was decided to artificially drain the lake. It began in the 17th century and was not completed until 1967. However, because of this, the city now suffers from lack of water and is constantly sinking on the lake bed. The remnants of the ancient lake can be found in Chochimilco. Taking a canoe ride down the canals of Chochimilco can be like taking a journey back in time. On the canals, you can see the various chinapas or man-made floating gardens that grow organic food. This is the same floating garden technique that the Aztecs used to grow their food and to feed their large population. However, Chochimilco is now mostly a party spot. Mexico City is huge and there is no way you can explore most of the city in just a few days. One thing I recommend is taking a trip to the Placio de Belas Artes to see the wall mural or fresco Man Controller of the Universe by Diego Rivera. The Mexican Revolution beginning in 1910 produced a cultural renaissance which caused the people to look inward for their own Mexican identity. One way this was expressed was through art. Because frescoes are made as part of the wall, they cannot be moved. They are all original art pieces. Man Controller of the Universe is actually the second rendition of the painting. The first was called Man at the Crossroads and was painted in New York City in 1933. 
The first rendition was commissioned by John D. Rockefeller Jr. for 30 Rockefeller Plaza, the Art Deco skyscraper in New York. The original in New York did not survive because Rivera included in the fresco communists like Vladimir Lenin. Rockefeller did not like this and ordered Rivera to remove the figures. So the fresco was removed by chipping it off the wall. Rivera was then granted the opportunity to paint it in Mexico City. Here in Mexico City, the original title Man at the Crossroads was changed to Man Controller of the Universe. At the center of the picture, you have a man who is operating a machine that appears to be in control of the rest of the universe unfolding around him. The reasoning for the first title of the fresco is easily seen as well as the picture illustrates humanity at the crossroads. At the time of the painting in the early 1930s, it was unclear which direction humanity would take and the way the future would go. In the 30s, the world was in a state of disarray with the clouds of war looming. The 1930s gave way to the rise of fascism, colonization, the Great Depression around the world, and was capped off with the beginning of World War II. Rivera was sympathetic to communist beliefs. At the time, it was looked at by many to be the answer, a system that didn't just benefit the elite. The early 1900s was also a time when many scientific and technological discoveries were being made, both in the heavens above and the microscopic within. Knowledge is power. Depending on how we use that knowledge, we can either heal or we can destroy. The center of the picture is a hand holding an orb that appears to be the control panel. Inside the panel are diagrams of atomic orbitals and a cell division in anaphase, the fourth stage of mitosis in which a parent cell is duplicated and divides into two identical daughter cells. This orb is at the center of the art because it represents the base of our current understanding of reality and the depths of our ability to manipulate and control. The smaller and smaller we are able to master, the more foundational power we have. The infinite is composed of the finite. Everything is made up of atoms. To master the atom is to master everything. Internal in us is a universe of life and complexity. In order to understand ourselves, we must understand genetics, our source code, who we are, where we come from, and how we adapt to our environment. This foundational knowledge then allows us to conquer the external universe around us. A proverb from ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet was to know thyself. To know thyself is to know God, and to know God is to know thyself. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that every time you look at a black man, you are looking at God. Our bodies are the real temple of God. With this knowledge comes limitless possibilities. As our knowledge and mastery increases, we have infinite capacity to manifest whatever we will into reality. The title Hombre Controlador del Universo is accurate and powerful. However, this power comes with great responsibility. This is why the original name, Man at the Crossroads, is just as fitting for this fresco. If we are not cultivated morally, then our knowledge becomes destructive. The knowledge of the atom could be used to save the world, but in the wrong hands, it will destroy everything. True spirituality is introspection, in the active cultivation of the best parts of ourselves that shapes us to have a predisposition to beneficence, mercy, and love. It is vitally important that we study history so that we don't make the same mistakes of the past. Never think that you don't have control or the power to change your life and your surroundings. Now more than ever, we are at the crossroads. The people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. Thank you for watching. Be sure to check out part two as we go into the science and wisdom of Teotihuacan. Ha, <laughs> ha,